Israel and Palestine, and um, as a person who has always hoped for the best amongst all these beautiful Jewish and Arab people who deserve to be friends, not enemies, right? Um, I will read this poem, Peace. I am disturbed often by the way my father's people are referred to on television, for example, or by people I feel don't really have the right to insult them and stereotype them in that way. But so many of my close Jewish friends in my life would never do that. And so we have to hang on to all the hopeful notes we hear, wherever they are. And even when we're disgusted or disturbed by things in the news, remember that's not the full story. There's more, there's other people who would be generous, who would respect, um, who would consider everyone an equal human being on the earth. So this poem has two parts and it's called Peace. People pass you in the street and do not see you. Apparition, hidden river, inhabitant of cracks. After battering talk, a room clears and you're on the ceiling, extending your silent hand, water of light poured freely, a hand, not a flag. You don't believe in flags anymore. You're not even sure you believe in men. Birds, children, silver trays, no problem here. Each day they trade their air and song. They feed you. Two, rounding the last old city corner to school, for years and years, a boy touched his finger to the same chipped stone in a wall. Befriending one another was no trouble. The boy knew what came next, tight desk, stretching hours. 60 years later, in another country, he tells one person about his stone, then goes outside to stare into trees. Is it still there? He will find it. What if it is not there? He will find it. So let's keep hope. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. So a few from Voices in the Air, the book that your school has here. And a, a poem, a lot of the poems in this book refer to writers who have fed me my whole life. Um, as a child, in high school, in life ongoing. And they stay with us. They're our companions. Um, so I think... You know, it's really nice to tell people who our favorite writers are and talk about a great book we've just read um, and, and keep doing that all of our lives. But also uh, something I was thinking as we were hearing uh, the great tweets uh, uh, um, from, from Gary's writing, that was such a great presentation and the student readers were fantastic the way they really read that as a beautiful script. Um, I was just thinking about all the technology that wasn't here the last time I was in your school, like probably Hardly any was here. Um, and it's just like we're in a totally different world in some ways. But I've found, but not, but not. It's still a very essential world, and I still believe in carrying around your little notebook wherever you go. I still like to write in my notebook every morning, physically, even with a pencil sometimes. But one thing I like to do sometimes is if I feel like I've gotten way behind this weird feeling on your email, and you haven't answered an email in three days, it's like overwhelming, then you go back to it, you're ready to faint. Um, I've tried answering some emails as little poems. And you can just try that, because if you're kind of doing two things at once. And sometimes you might come up with a line or something you'd like to keep. And this one was like that for me. To manage. She writes to me, I can't sleep because I'm 17. Sometimes I lie awake thinking, I didn't even clean my room yet, and soon I will be 25 and a failure. And when I am 50, oh, I write her back. Slowly, slow, clean one drawer. Arrange words on a page. Let them find one another, find you. Trust they might know something. You aren't living the whole thing at once. That's what a minute said to an hour, without me, you are nothing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, and this is from that rich, um, rich trove of memory that we all carry always. I remember when I was in high school feeling like my memory was already huge. And uh, writing was one way you could keep track of little bits of it or parts you wanted to remember or something that was mysterious to you, something you could thread together with something else that might happen in the future. So um, this poem is called Bully. By the way, I went to elementary school in Ferguson, Missouri. And then my parents moved from there to Jerusalem, which was my father's home city. <clears throat> One boy in our grade school was considered a bully, muttering rude insults under his breath, tripping girls as they walked to their desks. He bothered everyone equally, shook his shaggy blonde hair when teachers called his name. My mom, hearing the tales, decided he was lonely. No one ever played with him. In those days, bullies weren't popular and committed me to attending a children's Christmas party with him in the basement of a Methodist church. Somehow, she arranged this plan with his mother as they waited for us by the schoolyard. Impressive, he had a mother who waited. He seemed like a person who sprang from a forest, growling. <laughs> My parents argued about the Christmas party every night before it happened. Daddy said Mom was sacrificing me to her idealism. He kept calling it my first date. I was only interested in what people did in the basements of churches and what I would wear. And would there be cake? Since we ate no sugar at our house, idealism, I dreamed of meeting sweets everywhere else. The night of the party, Bully wore a suit and striped tie. He didn't growl. It was his church but he didn't seem to know anyone. I stood in my puffed pink icing of a ruffled dress by the cake table and watched him. He skulked around while the choir sang Christmas songs, looked embarrassed when Santa appeared. I talked to him any time he came near. Would you like some cake? I don't recall him bothering me again at school for the rest of our years. So this weird thing happened this summer. This guy I hadn't seen literally since second grade showed up at my door. This is how Facebook and I guess Instagram, everybody finds everybody. And um, I was really happy to see him. I would, had always wanted, he was a good friend of mine in second grade. He always gave girls the biggest Valentines. He was shorter than all the girls, so he was not a bully. We all considered him like our, our friend, our pet, our dear pal. Anyway, he shows up at my door, and he, he says, I found you. I've been looking for you all these years. I said, this is crazy. Come in. So one of the first questions he asks me is if I remember the bully. And I said, yeah, I wrote a poem about him. It just came out recently. And so I get the book. And I sit down and read it to him, and he looks kind of amazed, and then he says, you know one thing that's haunted me all these years is that the parents in our class, now I did not remember this at all, the parents in our class made a petition, and all the parents signed it, except your parents and my parents, and it was saying that they didn't want their children to have to sit next to the bully. And, um, do you think he knew about that petition? And I said, gosh, I don't remember anything about it. Let's call my mom right now. <laughs> she did remember it. And then he said, let's Google him. And we found him. And he's still living in the town where we lived, um, actually the next town over. And then this friend, who I have not seen in all these years, says, you and I have to go visit him. <laughs> and we have to find out what happened in his life. How has life been? And now I'm thinking that's like the main thing I want to do next summer is go with this guy and visit the bully. And, and of course, we won't call him the bully when we show up at his door. We'll just say, tell us about your life. Do you remember us? 
So one thing I like about writing something down is the story isn't necessarily ended. Um, maybe the best part of that poem or that those memories have, hasn't even happened yet. Um, so I'm gonna read a couple for other writers. Um, Emily Dickinson. I loved her when I was three before I could even write. And this is something I found out years later doing a Skype session with students in Baghdad. Um, and by the way, that's a great thing about technology that you can do Skype with Gaza, Baghdad, anywhere while you're sitting at home. What would you do if you knew that even during wartime, scholars in Baghdad were translating your poems into Arabic, still believing in the thing with feathers? You wouldn't feel lonely, that's for sure. Words finding friends, even if written on envelope flaps or left in a drawer. And here's one to the great writer Maya Angelou. Has anyone here read Maya? Maya's work, great writer. Um, there's a quote at the top of the poem that comes from her writing. Let gratitude be the pillow upon which you kneel. Um, luckily for the writers of San Antonio where I live, Maya's best friends lived in San Antonio. So two times she came through town and um, invited, told her friends, invite 20 people to dinner. And so we got to have dinner with her twice. And she's so incredible. She would not accept any complaint on any topic. So this is a little about her, her and something I didn't know about her before. Gratitude pillow. Maya loved the jingle of the massive key ring carried by cable car conductors. First woman in the San Francisco trolley uniform. She liked the shiny buttons on the jackets, appreciated the swoops and dips of the roots, sharp curves, corners, bustling avenues. Clinking coin dispenser latched to her belt. She'd be a conductor all her life, write and talk, take people everywhere out of their tight little rooms. And if anyone told her they were going to Gloomy Street, she'd say, what? Lift those eyes. Take a look at the sea to your right. Buildings full of mysteries, schools crackling with joy, open porches. Watch the world whirl by all we are given without having to own and shake that gloom right out of your system. Hope is the only drink you need to be drinking. Jingle, jingle. Step right up. And thank you so much. And um, this is for my favorite poet of my whole lifetime, William Stafford. And he was a very modest person. He was uh, born and grew up first in Kansas. He didn't publish his first book till he was in his mid 40s. And then he went on to be incredibly prolific, to win the National Book Award, to be the American Poet Laureate, uh, to do so many things for poetry, but mostly to encourage thousands of students and listeners coast to coast. And he was so devoted to his craft, to his practice. He believed in writing every day before you do anything else. He got up at 4.30 in the morning. He liked to write in a horizontal position, lying on his couch and holding his notebook above him, which does not really work for me very well, but everybody develops their own practices. Um, and because it worked for him, he kept doing it. He encouraged everybody to feel comfortable, to write down what occurred to you, to pay attention to the details you experienced within the last 24 hours, not to wait around for big ideas, sometimes not even to wait around for little ideas, just to ask some questions, think of some voices you'd heard, um, try to put two details together. And he believed that wisdom that we needed would often emerge through the actual act of writing on the page. That it wasn't like you had a great thought and then you went and wrote it down. It was like you started writing and new thoughts occurred. So it was very much a think as you go process of writing. So this is called Woven by Air, Texture of Air. And a quote 
from William Stafford at the top, your job is to find out what the world is trying to be. Some birds hide in leaves so effectively, you don't see they're all around you. Brown tilted heads, observing human maneuvers on a sidewalk. Was that a crumb someone threw? Picking and poking, no fanfare for company, gray huddle on a branch, blending in. Attention deeper than a whole day. Who says, I'll be a thoughtful bird when I grow up? Stay humble, blend, belong to all directions, fly low, love a shadow, and sing. Sing freely. Never let anything get in the way of your singing. Not darkness, not winter, not the cries of flashier birds, not the silence that finds you steadfast, pen ready at the edge of 4 a.m. Your day is so wide, it will outlive everyone. It has no roof, no sides. Thank you very much. I'll read a, a poem each from two more recent books. This one is not even out yet. It's called Castaway. It's about trash. And um, I've been picking up trash all my life, whatever neighborhood I was in. Um, sometimes people are shocked if you're like taking a walk with them and you keep pausing to pick up trash. But um, it's been, I guess, just a hobby, a sideline of my life. And so I used to tell kids when they would say to me, oh ma'am, I don't have anything to write about. Okay, well you're writing about the trash can. I want you to write about your personal relationship with the trash can. And incredible poems would be born. And everyone had one. Like something they'd thrown away a long time ago that they wish they hadn't, or writing from the point of view of the trash can, which I actually don't even do in this book, but I could have. Um, so gathering my own poems about trash over the years, I'll just read you two from this book. This is called Tin Foil Merges with Street. Oh, and also there are some poems in this book relating to our current moment in history. Um, the subtitle is Poems for Our Time. So there's a whole series of poems that thread through the book that are called like Trash Talk and then a number like 326, 1072. Tin foil merges with street. Pretends it could melt. Sticks to pavement like ugly news sticks to brain. Ads fade overnight. Half-priced ice cream. Oh, swiftly disappearing sunset. Smashed cup. Whole world feels bottoms up. Refugee zones have trouble with trash. One of many services not offered. I'll put you on next class, thanks. Um, thank you very much though. Junk mail. The great poet, William Stanley Merwin, known as W.S., wrote first drafts of his poems on junk mail envelopes plucked from his garbage. So he never had to worry about wasting paper or being perfect. And uh, this is called, Trash is a Ticket to Nowhere. It says, I do not care about you, poof. You can pick me up if you want to. The person who dropped me was more important than the person who picks me up. What? Make our smallest moves the right ones. On a San Antonio street called Dallas, the corner of Baltimore, all of us connected, like it or not, if we're alive, isn't it all ours? Even the street called Cary Grant? <laughs> Bent wire, styrofoam, snaps. Here's the rim of a pizza box from the Mesozoic era. Trash says, disregard, disregard. And this book is, thank you. Um, this book is, it's dedicated to one of my favorite poets. I hope everybody reads Kathy Song. She's been one of my favorite poets. She's, she grew up and lives in Honolulu. Um, her next book coming out is a book of short stories. It's her first book of short stories, but um, the, the little subtitle under my dedication to Kathy is, I couldn't save the world, but I can pick up trash. Because she and I have walked together on the island of Oahu so many times in our different ages of life. 
and she always teases me that I'm picking up the trash and taking too long. But um, you know, even in the most gorgeous places in the world, you may find some, although not much in Japan. Um, Kathy is half Korean, half Chinese, and she's written out of both of her, her backgrounds, plus living in Hawaii. So she's a really um, beautiful writer to read her work. So does anybody have any questions? And then I'll close with uh, one or two poems. Ha and by the way, teachers, uh, do I close at 11 or? 11.05, okay. So we have time for a few questions and I'll close with maybe two, three quick poems. I'll see if I can. Anybody have any questions? Don't be shy. Yes, hi. Your, uh, uh, your writing style, has it always been this way or like has it developed over time and how have you developed it over time? Well, that's an interesting question. Has my writing style always been this way? What way would you describe it like? Very fun. Uh, oh, thanks. That means a lot to me, fun, childlike, create. Um, I've all, thank you for saying that, that's really a compliment to me. I would say that my writing style has always been uh, similar. You know, I've, I've tried a lot of different things. I was a songwriter when I was young, I rhymed in my songs. Um, of course, when I was in school and our teachers would assign sonnets, villanelles, you know, haiku, poetry, unit, whatever we were working on, uh, never FX, thank goodness. I would try all these different forms of poetry, but really the open narrative form has been my style um, all my life. And um, I do really practice the, 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 the tap, I write every day. You know, I, I just write little things down every day and then I go back to, to things and look for what might be there. And I don't have a different attitude really if I'm writing for elementary age children or teens or adults. You know, some people say, do you feel really different when you're writing for different ages? No. So I guess that would be an answer to your question too. And I do believe what Chicago native, who would later become my neighbor in San Antonio, Sandra Cisneros, uh, she wrote in one of her books um, that we all carry all of our ages inside us. Like even when you're older, you still have 11 in there somewhere and three and 28 when you get to be my age. And that's comforting to know that you know you carry all your ages and have different perspectives, so I guess it works that way. Thanks for that question. Nobody's ever really asked me that. Um, I never thought I would write novels, though, and I'm working on my, I guess, fifth one right now, so that's kind of a surprise. It's a longer form. Yes? Well, thank you. It's a question about optimism. Where did it come from? Um, well, I can, I can give you uh, two answers, really. I, I think being an avid reader since early childhood helped me have optimism because, you know, even if I was in a place where I didn't know, know anybody, I could have a book with me and I could feel like I always had a friend with me wherever I was because a book is your friend when you're reading it, you know, you're involved in it. So that creates kind of a sense of companionship in the world. Um, as Tony sang, you know, we're never alone. And um, another thing I would say is that, you know, people have, you do carry certain elements, in, intuitive elements. It just seemed you could kind of go either way um, in life and it was, you probably would enjoy your life more if you were an optimist. Um, but, but I do say now, because she's over it, my mom is still alive, she's 92, but my mom suffered um, from extreme depression when she was a child, a teenager, and a, a young person. And it was really probably worse for her when she was young and it got better as her life go, went on. And when she was in her 80s, she actually, she, she tells people she blew out the fuse of depression. She no longer has it at all, which is pretty incredible. But um, so growing up, seeing a really cheerful, optimistic father, even though he was a refugee and had been through really hard experiences, like his best friend was murdered in his presence when he was 21, I mean, that's a pretty bad thing to overcome. And he felt sad about it all his life. And then my mother, who would have really severe ups and downs, um, you know, I was kind of in between these two people and trying to just navigate my way. But my mother was also a big believer in exposure to art. And that marked my childhood a lot because she went to art school, she was a painter. Her teachers were Philip Guston and Max Beckmann, really great world artists. So that was like a place where she was happiest. And so she took me, I mean, I went to the Chicago Art Institute with her and the St. Louis Art Museum every single Sunday afternoon 
as a child. Um, she took me to be in the presence of art um, for my whole childhood, and I think that helped with optimism too, because it made me think about all the different ways there are to see things, you know, and um, that's a great gift, just to be in the presence of art. And we don't have to be experts on it. Like, I, I couldn't get up here and give you you know, a lecture on modern art or older art or any, but I love art. I just love being in galleries, being around it. Just like we love certain kinds of music, we don't have to be experts on them. Um, so just, I think, continually putting ourselves in the presence of created work helps our optimism, whatever it is, music or good cooking, good food, learning how to cook better. I've been teaching my three-year-old grandson how to flute pie crusts. I never could imagine a three-year-old boy would be that ecstatic every time we make a pie. So we've been making a lot of pies lately. <laughs> but thank you for that question, because it is an important one in our time. I mean, we can't let breaking news define us, and breaking news is certainly depressing. Uh, so we need other things to navigate with. So thank you to have a writer's week in your school that respects writers, you know, it respects the other things we need. Thank you. In the back row, is there a question? Anybody? Yes. Hi. Oh wow, I have so many Stafford poems that are my favorites. But I would say two favorite Stafford poems um, would be two that were very late in his life and they ended up being in a posthumous book of his. One was the title poem, because he had actually written in his notebook that he wanted it to be the title poem. It's called um, The Way It Is. And I actually have it on the table here, I could read it. It's very short, The Way It Is. That's a very helpful poem. And um, another one is a poem that um, startlingly he wrote about only three days before his very sudden death. And the title of it is, You Reading This, Be Ready. And it's a poem calling people to pay better attention. Like, don't miss any day. You know, look around the room. Who's here? What's here? What might you want to remember from this place? But I'll read the way it is, because I think that relates to, to all of you and your own studies, your own education, whatever you love the most. The thread, okay, the way it is. There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen. People get hurt or die. And you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. William Stafford. So thank you for that question. Um, thank you for all your good questions. So I'll close with two poems. I really have appreciated um, getting to be here. And I'm gonna read one, I just, I, I just opened, I just opened the, to this page, and I have never read this aloud, but um, this is from a book that came out last year called The Tiny Journalist, and it's about um, a little girl, she's only 13 now, Jana Jihad Ayad is her name. I learned about her, I actually joined Facebook so I could follow her page, and there's a little video about her that was an Academy Award finalist a few years ago, called Radiance of Resistance. And Jenna was the self-described self youngest journalist in the world, starting when she was six and seven. She just started taking pictures with her mom's phone of the things that happened around her Palestinian village in the West Bank. Um, and the village is called Nebi Saleh, and it's very close to the village my grandmother lived in until she died at the age of 106. So um, I think about I think about Jenna, and uh, we're in touch. She receives all the royalties from this book, and she has started a, a nonprofit foundation for education for Palestinian children who need help with their education. So this is called, It Was or It Wasn't. Arabic fairy tales begin this way. So do Arabic days. A pantry is empty. But Mama still produces a tray of tea and cookies for the guest. West 
is still the way we stare, knowing there's blue space and free water over there. There's a Palestinian and a Jew building a synagogue together in Arkansas. They're friends with respect. Actually, our water isn't free, nor are the fish my friends in Gaza aren't allowed to catch. It was or it wasn't a democracy, a haven for human beings, but only some of them. You can't do that with people. Pretend they aren't there. It was or it wasn't a crowd. Diploma, marriage, legacy, babies being born, children being killed, it was or it wasn't going to work out. Well, let's hope it does. Mm -hmm. Let's hope it does. Uh, and um, I'll close with this. So one time, I was in a high school somewhere, and I don't know, none of us liked really the ideas that I had for writing that day. Um, I can't remember what they were, but I said, OK, why doesn't everybody try um, write a poem to a gift that somebody gave you that you didn't like. And then suddenly everybody started going. We all had something to write to. It was kind of funny. And so I will read one to a gift I got. And, um, and then this crazy thing happened to this poem. So first of all, tell me as I'm looking for the poem, I'm sorry, I thought I had it marked. Who knows what is the, um, what is the state motto of Illinois? Bird. Huh? <laughs> Bird? Huh? The state motto. What is it? It's not the thing on the license plate. It's some other thing. The state motto. But we don't know our state mottos. That's my point. And someone gave me, I live in a very tiny house. My husband and I love our old cottage. But someone gave me this huge map made by an artist that has on every state the state's state motto. That's weird. And um, I, I never hung it up because it's so big and I don't have an extra wall. But um, it sat by my bed for a long time. And then I wrote this poem in the middle of the night when I couldn't sleep. And then this poem got to go on tour with Bono and U2. Um, I got a letter from his lawyer saying Bono really likes this poem. What? And he wants to take it on tour and have it scrolling behind him on a screen. Would you allow that? I thought, who would not? <laughs> to have a poem about something you didn't even like? Go on tour with Bono? Yeah, that's fine with me. He also <laughs> took my poem, Kindness, and they went on tour. Um, so here it is, and these are actual state mottos, but I'm sorry, Illinois is not included. United, I didn't include, maybe yours is in Latin. I didn't include Latin since I don't speak it. Okay, United, when sleepless, and thank you all for your beautiful listening. I'll just close with this. When sleepless, it's helpful to meditate on mottos of the states. South Carolina, while I breathe, I hope. Perhaps this could be the new flag on the empty flagpole. Or I direct from Maine. Why? Because Maine gets the first sunrise? How bossy, Maine. In Arkansas, the people rule. Lucky you. Kansas, to the stars, through difficulties, clackety wagon wheels, long land, and the droning press of heat. Cool stars, relief. Idaho, let it be perpetual. Now this is strange. Idaho, what is your it? Who chose these lines? How many contenders? What would my motto be tonight? Entangled sheets. Texas, friendship, now boasts the open carry law. Wisconsin, where my mother's parents are buried, chose forward. Washington, wisest, by and by. New Mexico, it grows as it goes. Now this is scary, <laughs> two dangling its. This does not represent that glorious place. West Virginia, mountaineers are always free. Really? <laughs> Oklahoma must be tired. Labor conquers all things. Oklahoma, get together with Nevada, who chose only industry as motto. I think of Nevada as a playground, or mostly empty. How wrong we are 
about one another, for Alaska to pick north to the future seems odd. Where else are they going? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, boyfriend.